I would like to talk about six books that changed the way I think. And these books are all kind of under the category of how do you know what is true and what is not, especially given that the instrument I have for discerning truth is my brain and quite frankly, my nervous system, which is subject to bias, subject to emotions. So these books really fall under the category of, if, if you wanna use a philosophy jargony word, epistemology. And epistemology is uh, how you know what is true or what is false. It's the philosophy behind that. There are tons of philosophers who have looked at this question. Now, these are all funner books to read. Some of them are a little more academic than others, but they're all for broad audiences. They're all very approachable, and they all really changed how I think about the world. So the first one is Thinking Fast and Slow, and this is the book I probably refer to the most on this channel. I teach behavioral economics, and this is the base textbook for that course. And other behavioral economists I've talked to also use this as one of their base textbooks, even though it's not a textbook. Now, this one is a little bit more of an academic read. Um, it's, it's, it's a book that a lot of people will start it and they'll read perhaps the first section or the first third. They'll put it aside and think about it because it's, it's very dense with ideas. The key ideas he covers in the book are the ideas of the system one versus system two thinking, where system one is the reactive, uh, instinctive part of yourself. System two is the deliberative thinking, the slow part of your thought. He also talks a lot about probability and how we understand risk and how we understand probabilistic things, because our brains are not necessarily great at handling that. And he goes over all the different kinds of biases that our brains have so that we can adjust those biases when we're trying to figure out what's true or not. Now, one thing about this book is that some psychologists will say that there's some information in the book that's out of date. Um, and I think part of the reason there is that the, the book was published in 2011 and the field of psychology, of course, has paid a lot of attention to these ideas and therefore they've updated, they've added a nuance to some of these ideas. One of the ideas that I think is most critiqued is the idea of priming, which he talks about in this book. And my guess is he would update that section of the book if he were rewriting this book now. But I still think this is a very solid book in terms of the conceptual understanding for how to think about the world. And he gives a lot of examples of experiments that help you understand that conceptual framework and that help you understand how academics have come to understand things that way. So you can kind of view any particular study he's talking about in this book with a little bit of skepticism that perhaps just because he's explaining the study doesn't mean it has no critiques in the field of psychology. And it doesn't mean that there haven't been updated studies that find different things since then. But this is really about what is a good conceptual framework for understanding the world. The second book on my list is The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And the subtitle I think is informative, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. So this book is really about how do people think about morality and how do they interact with information given that people are pretty reactive when it comes to morality and why do different cultures have different systems of morality. So the book is in three different sections and each of them really has a theme. The big thing from the first third of the book is the idea of the elephant and the writer where the elephant is the reactive self I would relate the elephant to system one from Kahneman and the writer is the intellectual cognitive thinker. I would relate the writer to system two. It's the deliberative thinker. And basically he makes the argument that the writer is basically the PR representative for the elephant. It's not that we're all fully logical thinkers and we're going around processing information 
accurately. We're sort of reactive people where our elephant wants things, it's, it's off track all the time, it gets attracted to things, it has negative reactions to things. And um, a lot of what's going on when we construct our morality is that our elephant has negative and positive reactions and then our cognitive thinker, our writer, will try to justify the elephant's instinctive reactions. Now, he doesn't believe that the writer has no say. Like, he's an educator, he does believe that we can train our writers to be more critical thinkers. But the writer is perhaps not as in control as sometimes we, we are led to believe. And then the middle third of the book is really about why do different cultures have different moralities? And he kind of makes the argument that there's people have different tastes in morality, where there's different types of morality, like how much emphasis do you put on care versus fairness versus loyalty versus sacred objects or sacred ideas. And the way people relate to that, the, the way people weigh those different values in their moral system is akin to different tastes people have, where some people like sweet things, some people like salty things a little bit more. So um, he really talks about moral taste and how that might differ across cultures. And then the third section of this book is basically uh, the section on social networks and the hive mentality. And the thesis there is that morality binds and blinds, that when we come up with a certain set of moral tastes, whether that's our political moral tastes or our religious moral tastes, those tastes bind us to other people in our in-group and they make us blind to information that comes in that could contradict what's held sacred in, in our moral in-group. Super powerful book. My next book recommendation is How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett. And she argues that there's no such thing as universal emotions, but rather our emotions get created through concepts that interpret what we're feeling inside in the context of our environment, our life. Um, it's this sort of full context of what we feel inside, which is how emotions are experienced in the internal world. Interoception is what she calls that and how that is contextualized. That our interpretation of emotions is going to be different depending on the concepts we inherit from our culture. And she has a whole chapter on concepts. Now, one of the more useful concepts she explains in this book is the idea of the body budget, how we have a certain limited amount of energy and our brains are constantly trying to optimally use that energy where there's the greatest threat, where it's most important for us to put forth energy. And that our emotions come out of that relationship between our brains predicting how much energy we need and the way the body budget is managed in terms of energy use. So that framework was just, I thought, brilliant and completely reshaped the way I think about emotions. And of course, emotions are what's driving the elephant in Jonathan Haidt's framework. They're what's driving the system one reactive system in Kahneman's book. And we know that that system one, that, that elephant, has a big impact on how we interpret the world. So understanding how our brains make these predictions and how our brains use concepts to interpret the world and interpret how we feel that's just super useful if we want to think about the instrument through which we understand truth and we understand reality. My next book recommendation is Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. And if you look at all of these books, this might be the book that doesn't seem like it belongs with the other books because this one is slightly self-helpy, but I want to make a case for why this book does belong on this list. And that is because of the expertise element here. 
So if we're trying to understand the world and understand information we're taking in, so much of that information is not going to be information we're directly verifying. It's coming from experts of some sort. So we need a way of sort of critically judging which experts to listen to, when to be skeptical, which experts to dismiss, and to, to think about that clearly, we need a, a solid understanding of how expertise is formed. So this book, it's self-helpy in the sense that it's giving advice about how you could develop expertise based on years of studying uh, experts in their fields. Now, a lot of the examples in this book have to do with music or chess or sports, which are not necessarily expertise per se. But the same concept, I think, does apply to people developing academic expertise. And this is the book where the 10,000 practice hours comes from. The idea is if you want to become an expert, you need to put in at least 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. And this is one complaint, of course, is that some people will just say, oh, if you're doing it, then you must be practicing. Whereas uh, a lot of people practice without improving or without the deliberative part of this. So the deliberative part of the practice is basically you paying attention to what you're doing, getting feedback from coaches, giving yourself feedback, developing mental models about how to improve so that you're not just doing it, but you're careful about how to improve over time through these different feedback and adjustment techniques. And that's how expertise happens. That's how you develop it. So I think this book is super brilliant and important, and I think it relates to how you understand the world because um, it's not just how you get better at things, it's when someone is an expert, how did they get to where they are? And then my last book on this particular list is The Constitution of Knowledge by Jonathan Rout. And his basic idea is that there's these three realms. There's the economic realm, the political realm, and the informational realm, or the epistemic realm. And he basically makes the case that since we're kind of in an epistemic crisis, we need some guidelines for developing a system that's going to do a better job at the epistemic part at telling what's true and what's false. And he makes the comparison with the Constitution of the United States, which is in the political realm. But that Constitution sort of sets up a framework that's both on paper and written out, but it's also a framework that has to sort of live in people's hearts and be enacted through you know, people disagreeing and people engaging with the system in certain ways. So his, his idea in this book is that um, we need a constitution of knowledge which does the same thing that the constitution of the United States did for the political realm, except this one does it for the epistemic realm. And he's thinking about journalism, he's a journalist, and academia, of course. And he just lays out some guidelines, such as nobody gets the final say, uh, information needs to be checkable by other people. He really goes deep into the philosophy behind this. And he he lays out some, some reasons why we're having problems in the epistemic realm because of pollution of disinformation and information that's really just out there to get under people's skin, and also because of cancel culture making people afraid to participate in the, the constitution of knowledge in a way that is important and meaningful to challenge each other's ideas. Now, he misses a few big major points. I don't need to go into that right now. And the only other thing I want to say about this book is that this book rubs people both on the right and on the left the wrong way. Like, if you read it, regardless of what your political beliefs are, you may have moments when, when you react negatively to what he's saying, and, and particularly to specific examples or specific things he's saying. I've done a book group on this, I've talked to friends about this, and I've seen that happen with people on both sides of the aisle. 
And one thing about that is I think for, to, to learn from people who think differently than you, you kind of have to be willing to read stuff that that irks you or that like gets your elephant kind of upset and is just like, yuck, that's so disgusting. But I've found if I'm willing to do that, if I'm willing to continue reading a book, even if I kind of have to plug my nose in certain segments of the book, oftentimes those are the books that challenge my thinking the most because obviously that means it's coming from someone who thinks really differently than myself. And I will say it's not usually the part I have to plug my nose about that I'm uh, that changes my mind. Usually I, I'm still like, well, that that segment was still kind of biased in some ways. But there's this other part of that book that totally changed the way I think. And if to get to those morsels of truth and those morsels of creativity, I have to, you know, g wade through some stuff that I don't like and that I think is biased and can't see its own bias. It's worth it for me. So, um, highly recommend this book. So those are the six books that most changed how I think about the world. And anyone who's interested in this topic, anyone who's frustrated with the fact that we have so much conflict over what is true and what is not true, this set of books will really set you up well to understand the world better and to be better at like processing information that you get from a variety of sources.